All right, we've got to get in and get to preaching and get at it, but that's about all I know to say right now. So 1 Samuel chapter 25 there, everybody there say amen. amen. Boy, that was weak. Everybody there say amen. amen. All right, listen, you're going to have to get in this thing today, all right? We're going to have to try to preach hard, try to preach quick. Uh, Samuel, we're preaching through the life of David. That's what we're preaching on, the life of David. We preached last week about uh, him uh, getting his life back on track, how that he got the prophet, the priest, and the king. And when you get Jesus Christ, your Savior, operating as prophet, priest, and king in your life, you're going to have the word of God, the prophet, you're going to have the prayer life, the priest, and you're going to have the obedient life, which is the blessing of the, and the king. And we saw how God began to bless his life and how he prayed. And if you didn't, weren't here to get that message, I'd really encourage you to get it. Because it's called getting your life back on track. God has already used that message in people's lives and certainly in mine. Then when we come up to chapter 25, we're at another place and moving on to another era or segment of David's life. And uh, we begin in verse number one. And we're going to read several verses. So please read along. And I'm going to make tell you to mark a verse once while to underline a passage. Please do that. Samuel died and all the Israelites gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel and the man was very great. I want you to underline that. He had 3,000 sheep, that's quite a few, and 1,000 goats and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, underline that, Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail. Now tonight I'll probably be preaching on Abigail, but today it's on Nabal. She was a woman of good understanding, of a beautiful countenance, but the man was, underline it, churlish and evil in his doings. You're going to get acquainted with a man by the name of Nabal today, and God has great wisdom and great instructions for us in learning what kind of person to be, conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. He gives us the negatives, he gives us the positives, and this man here is worth any man's study. If I were one of you young boys here, you need to learn the men of God. You need to learn about Caleb and, and as he was mentioned, Sunday school and all these people. But I'm telling you, learn about the, the guys that weren't so great. Because inside their lives are hid tremendous things that can keep us out of trouble in life. Verse number four, and David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear sheep. Now to back up just a little bit, David is with his 400 men. He's living in the wilderness, living in caves, wandering in the wilderness. Saul is chasing him. Saul's trying to kill him. This is where we've been going up to this point. David's still out there. He had that occasion when uh, he cut off the skirt of Saul and showed it to him. And what a great passage of scripture about your enemies and dealing with vengeance and letting God have vengeance and how to respond to those that are t- treating you wrong and doing wrong to you. So David's out here, and while he's out here, this man with the name of Nabal, who's a great farmer, big rancher, okay? Well, kind of v- v- hillbilly this thing. he got a big old farm, big old ranch. he got 3,000 sheep. He's got 1,000 goats. And the Bible said he was great. And it was, when it says that, it means he was a, he's a big dude in the area. Big farm, lots of cattle, lots of people working for him, okay? And uh, then it says, David uh, heard that Nabal was shearing his sheep. Now, shearing his sheep was like a big roundup. Sheep shearing time was no little deal. It was a time when the food and the wine and everybody, they kind of made a big party of it, a lot of work, but they kind of made a big deal of it. Harvest time on the sheep. Big deal. I'm telling you, big, I mean, sheep shearing in the Bible days was like a huge fall festival situation. Everybody comes in, everybody comes on the scene, and it's a time of reaping the fruits of what you have labored and sown for the year. David hears about this. So he comes up, he says, uh, he's got, he, so he sends 10 men, verse number five. David sent out 10 men and David said unto the young men, get you up to Carmel, underline 10, underline 10, that's real important here. And David said unto the young men, get you up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. So David sends 10 men up there, verse number six. And thus say, you say to him, David tells them exactly what to say. Thus you say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to thee and peace to thine house and peace be unto all that thou hast. Three times David sends a message of peace to Nabal. Verse number seven. Now I have heard that thou hast shears and now thy shepherds which are with us. We hurt them not, neither was there aught missing among them all the while they were in Carmel. David's men of war, these 400 men are living up here in the mountains. And Nabal's shepherds and his sheep, they never touched them. And they took, they, they made sure nobody else touched them. They were a wall, it says there. They were t- took care of them. 
He said, we didn't hurt anybody. We didn't steal any of your sheep. We respected you, actually protected you while you were there. In verse number 8, ask thy young men. He's given a verification of this now. They will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes. For we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand, unto thy servant, to thy son David. David's very humble there. He calls himself a servant of Nabal. He calls a son of, uh, his, thy son. And he approaches him with graciousness and humility. And what he's saying is this. It's harvest time. I've got 400 men. We have an army to feed. And he said, we've been good to you and we've protected you. And he sent his men down there to see if they wouldn't maybe give David's army some food and some uh, sustenance and so forth. And, uh, and David made a request. He didn't demand it. He didn't steal it. He just made a petition to this man about it. Now, verse number nine. When David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all the words in the name of David, David and ceased. So they, these ten young men came to him. They told him what David said. And now here's the response of Nabal. Nabal answered David's servants and says, Who is David? Underline that. And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. I want you to watch verse 11. I want you to underline the word my. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? And so David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told, them, told him all these sayings. Now verse 13 is the number, 13 is the number of rebellion. And uh, Christians can rebel and Christians can get off track. And David had just gotten his life back on track. He quit all that lying, quit all that nonsense, got his tra- life back on track. And there's something that happens here that ticks David off. I mean, it ticks it. Now, you ain't never seen a John Wayne movie get about as wild as this thing here's fixing to get. You ain't seen a Western where this thing's getting, getting fixed to get mean. David said this. Gird, said to his men, gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. Now, here's a bunch of guys who have killed hundreds. I mean, I mean you, you, he's talking about his mighty men. These are men that absolutely can wipe you out. These are men that can sling a sling and not miss you by a hair's breadth. These are men that knew how to kill people. They're an army. They got their swords on. They went up after David, about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. And one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, now we're back down at the ranch. David's still up on the hills. They're on, they got their horses mounted, the cavalry's coming, okay? But back down at the ranch, Nabal's wife, there's a young man came to Abigail, Nabal's wife, and said, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to slew our master, and he railed on them. Underline that, he railed on them. But the men were very, watch what the testimony of one of the servants of Nabal is. The men, David's men and his men, were very good to, to us. We were not hurt, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us, both by night and day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. I want to tell you something. One of the reasons that Nabal had such a great herd of sheep and goats is because there was an unseen hand watching over his life. There was somebody taking care of things for him. And, uh, you know, you and I need that. We've got a good God. Well, I've got to keep rolling. Anyway, verse 17, now therefore know and consider what that will do. Now here's what, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household. Now here's, I want you to get this. Here's what his own servants describe their master as, Nabal. He is such a, underline it, son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Now here's a servant who understood what was going on. He goes to Abigail, says, Abigail, listen, we got problems. He said, David sent some men down here. They've been good to us. They were a wall to us. They didn't steal from us. They took care of us. They've been good to, to your family and all of us. And your husband railed on them. He, they said, they, they come down here to see if we could share our goods with them. And Nabal railed on them, treated them like dirt. And you know what this servant saw? He saw in the eyes of those men when they left, trouble coming. And he knew they deserved it. With that response that Nabal gave him. Well, verse number 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine. By the way, oh, this is so good. That's communion. I'm trying to preach 42 messages and I I can't do this. (laughs) 
two bottles of wine and five sheep. Five is the number of grace. Now, what you see here is the church interceding for the sinner. Okay? Ready dress, five measures of parched corn, a hundred clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, and laid them on the ass. It sounded to me like a Proverbs 31 woman. She had the groceries in the house and in the cellar. She jumps up. She made haste in verse 18. Verse number 19, she said unto her servants, go on before me. <laughs> get on your horses. Get on your mules and ride. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. Now, we're going to get to that. That's a, you ought to, Every husband ought to underline that. Things is bad when you can't talk to your husband about serious problems in the family. They're bad. But that's what will happen when you become a Nabal. Verse 20, it was so as she rode on the ass that she came down by the covert of the hill. And behold, David and his men came down against her and she met him. Now David said, surely in vain, this is, this is going back to previous now, but as they were headed that way, surely in vain I have kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained to him, for he hath requited me evil for good. Underline that. So mourn also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave, leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. You know what he said? I'm going to kill every man in the house. I'm killing every man of that bunch and boy. Every one of them. He's hot. Okay. I want to remind you this morning that God has wrath. God is a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath. Verse 23. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted, lighted off the ass. Watch this. Fell before David on her face, bowed herself to the ground, fell at his feet, said, Upon me, O Lord, upon me let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee. And this is intercessory prayer like you ain't never seen. Speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man and be lyle, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. The word Nabal, the name means fool. It means fool. That's what his name was, Nabal. He said, but I thy, she said, but by thy handmaid saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst seen. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord... Now watch this, hath withholding thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand. Now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be his neighbor. Now I'll tell you what I've decided while I'm reading this. We're going to come back tonight and we're going to graze this chapter. We're just going to graze it, just picking up grass as we're going on. We're not probably going to preach, just graze through it and pick up the, I mean, there's gold and silver laying all on the trail of this thing for your life and my life. And so we're going to do that and I'm going to try to stay on track. Of the specific thing that I need to preach on today. And verse 27. Now this blessing which thine hand made hath brought unto my Lord. Let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee forgive the trespass of thine handmaid. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. Because, of my, Lord fighteth, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord. And evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Yet a man is risen to pursue, pursue thee and to seek my, thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound up in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. You will not read, and I, I'm sorry for stopping here. Maybe I just need to slow down this morning. You will never read a more intercessory way of making an appeal to somebody in the whole word of God. This woman is unreally, I mean, she's un, almost beyond, a mat, um, beyond comprehension wise. She used the word sling twice. Anybody know why she used this word sling twice? Because David's whole world had launched out in the sense of his, with a sling. And when she said the word sling, his heart was grabbed. I mean, this woman, we'll do this tonight. But I'm telling you what, just studying her prayer of appeal is unreal. And it'll teach us how to pray and how to petition God. Well, verse 30, and it came to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord, according to all the good that he has spoken concerning thee and shall have appointed the ruler over Israel, that this shall be no grief unto my Lord, neither offensive heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. And David said to Abigail, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice. Whew. Underline that. And blessed be thou which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. It was said of Robert E. Lee that when his blood got up, he was unreal. He was, uh, in fact, he made the statement himself. He said, when my blood's up, he said, I've got to watch myself. 
Every one of us in this church house here, when our blood's up, have to watch ourselves. You need to be really alert to what gets your blood up. David had been treated terribly by this man and had been so forth and his blood was up and he realized that now. And he was thanking God that somebody came to intervene and stopped him from doing what he was thinking about doing. Verse 34, for in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel lived, which has kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast hasted and come to meet me. Surely there had not been left in the Nabal by the morning light in the pisseth against the wall. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him. And said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice, and I have accepted thy person. Underline that. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast. Now, let's, now we're back down at the ranch. Abigail has met David. She's turned David away from coming and killing old men. She, she gives all that food. She comes back down to the ranch. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore, she told him nothing less or more until the morning light. But when it came to pass the morning that the wine was gone out of Nabal, boy, there's a message. And his wife had told him these things that his heart died within him and he became as a stone. And it came to pass about 10 days after that the Lord smote Nabal and he died. In order to preach what I want to preach, I don't generally read that long a text this morning, but I want to preach a message entitled why God called Nabal a fool. Why God called Nabal a fool. I want to say before I start preaching today that I'll listen to Nabal's life and I'll tell you something. I, I, I'm 63, as I said a while ago. And I don't know why we're so slow and hard for God's word to get into our hearts. Why it's just our hearts are like adamant. I wish that when I was about 18 that somebody would have hammered this message I'm getting ready to preach in my heart. It might have helped me keep him from making a lot of mistakes that I made. Uh... I look back at my life so often I've been the fool. I look at myself and I can see actions and conduct that reminds me of Nabal, Brother Phil. But I'm telling you, I want to preach this today, both lost and the saved, because a, sa- a lost man is a Nabal. There's no question about it. But a saved man can act like Nabal. And so I want to preach this on two ways today. The Bible said here that, his, uh, that he was churlish. In the beginning of our scripture there, the Bible said he was churlish. The word churlish means a propensity to be dense about truth and light and what's right. It has the effect of being hard, severe, rough, cruel, mean, fierce, sore all the time, chip on his shoulder, uh, always sore somewhere about something, stiff-necked, stubborn. Kindness and gentleness was not a part of his life. And he made, churlish means that you make life difficult for everybody around you. There's been times in my life when I look back and I, I look back at, you know, raising our children. And there have been times, Phil, when I was in such a mood that I made life difficult for caring the kids. You can be churlish and be a saved man. I want to encourage us all today to make up our mind and say while we're here at church worshiping God today, just forget about me that I'm preaching this. Let's look at the word of God. God's saying, Reggie, I don't want you to be churlish. I don't want you uh, cruel. I don't want you hard. I don't want you rough. I don't want you uh, sore all the time and stubborn and, and just making life miserable for everybody around you. But men can have a propensity to do that and women can too. He had a lot of possessions and he was guarding them. He had no time for other people. He had other people's feelings were not in his thoughts and he was consumed of himself. He was like the person that their life is all about me. It's all about me. Everything that's going on is about how it's going to affect me. Secondly, the Bible said he was evil in his doings. To be evil in his doings means this, that he would be willing to cheat, to lie, to deceive, to be dishonest in his business dealings. I often think about the movie Sergeant York. How many of you ever watched Sergeant York? How many members when Sergeant York needed to sell his mule and his possessions? And that old boy comes out there and he looks his mule over. Ah, oh, he said he ain't worth but about whatever it was, $5 or something. What he was doing was, the Bible said, the buyer saith it is not, it is not, till he goeth his way. In other words, it ain't worth nothing when I'm trying to buy it, but as quick as I own it, it's worth everything. That's being evil in your doings. When you beat somebody down, I've dealt with this all my life in auctions. They walk up to them. I, I never will forget. <laughs> I've seen the craziest things you've ever seen. 
They'll go around and they'll do stuff. Did you know that people will sabotage tractors and bulldozers and everything else and try to make something while you're off over yonder, uh, you know, selling other stuff? They'll sabotage stuff. That has to happen. So that when you get ready to stop out in Kansas, I didn't do this sale, but out in Kansas, they had a sale out there that lined up tractors and combines and everything. And the guy that hated this man's guts that was having a sale stole every key out of everything. This huge crowd was there, stole every key out of every tractor. So when they got ready to sell it, couldn't start nothing. It meant to hurt him. That's evil in your doings. But when you lie or deceive to cheat people, I saw uh, widows, you know, they lose their husbands. Neighbor man come over and say, now your husband told me that I could, if he died, sell that tractor to me for about half what it's worth. Well, I don't ever remember him talking about, well, yes, he did now. He told me. Churlish in his doings. You know what? As Christian people, we ought not be churlish and evil in our doings. We need to be honest. Uh, an evil, this kind of person here is one who thinks it's really cool if he can outsmart you in a business deal. If he can take advantage of your ignorance, you don't know what you're doing. Again, I go back to the business I've been in. I'm telling you something. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I've seen people. I mean, I've seen over there where I used to run at sale barn of dairy cattle. Nathan, you boys know. I, I, <laughs> we've seen it all. I mean, you got a cow. She's light quartered. I bought a cow one time at the Missouri State Holstein sale. I was a kid in high school. Drove my pickup truck with a rack to it. Down south. State Holstein sale. Finally, cow comes in that I thought I could afford. It's seven hundred some dollars. I'd saved up my hay haul of money, and I bought this cow. Boy, she looked good. I surprised her. Got her home and milked her out the first time, and found out she was really short, almost blind in one quarter. But they had filled her up. See, they had not milked that quarter. Milked the other three quarters. Leave that quarter. That's called evil in your doings. I, I've seen people take a, a, a heifer, spring a heifer that's blind in one quarter and get this stuff that, that masked out this stuff for dry treatment and put that up that quarter so when the veterinarian checked her to sell barn, the stuff come out and he called her four quartered and they knew she was three quartered and made themselves about three to four to five to six hundred dollars just with a little tube. Evil in the doings. I don't know about your life, what you do, but there's a lot of ways to cheat people. This is the kind of guy he was. He accumulated wealth by stealth. He thought it was really cool to drive a hard bargain. He thought it was real cool to take advantage of somebody. Just this week, I talked to a man who lost his property. And he told me about what happened. He said, Reggie, the helicopter flew over three times, made about three circles, and left. He said, when they sold my property at the courthouse steps he said his relatives of the bankers that bought it I know how many acres and I know how much they bought it for they stole it are you listening to me you don't want to be we do not need to be people who take advantage of people who are down and having a hard time of life this is real practical Christianity I've got to keep rolling the Bible says that the rich answereth roughly Proverbs 18, 23. Like a lot of men, he had a better wife, way better wife than he deserved. Her value to Nabal, though, this fool, was that she diffused a lot of volatile situations that would come up in his life. And she provided a good side to the family and the home. I've often thought about how in the world did Nabal and Abigail ever get together? Well, I don't know, but maybe Abigail had a dad who liked money better than he liked his daughter. And maybe it was an arranged marriage. And maybe Nabal had so much money and sheep and goats that he just could pay the biggest price. And she, 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 he arranged a marriage. Back in those days, that's what the, your dowry, it could happen if the daddy didn't love his daughter like he ought to. Amen. But it might be that she had done like so many other girls have done. She looked at Nabal and said, man, he's got, he's got a big ranch and he's got cattle and he's got livestock and he's got this and he's got that. No, I'll always be secure if I rope him. I don't know how she wound up with him, but hey, girls, be careful about who you're hooking up with. The truth about it is you're not going to really know him until after you've married him a while. Because you know what? All men are liars. Amen. They'll act spiritual. I'm going to tell you something. I cannot stand. It. Now, I'm getting my blood up now like David. I cannot stand for some dude to walk in this church 
who's after some girl in this church and he's as sorry as low down. And he puts on that. I'll, I'll tell you what I've seen him do. I've seen him play like they got saved, get baptized, go to church with her. I'm thinking of a guy right now. I'm married to a beautiful young lady right up here. And she found out not one week after they were married that he was in pornography. And they're divorced and they're gone. And she treated her like a dog and like a whore and like a porn queen. You better watch who you're marrying. I'm going to tell you another thing you can learn out of this. That Abigail hadn't left him. It was worse. Well, I got to get to the message. This is just. <laughs> but you know about old Nabal. She had adapted to it. Now, watch this. Nabal was out of the house of Caleb. Caleb was one of the two men, the spies, that believed God. And whenever 85 years, he said, God, give me this mountain. And so he did. And so he's a descendant of that. Here's what the message of that is to me. That it's only one generation away. You will lose your generation one time. I mean, you lose your children, your grandchildren in one generation. He had a great godly grandpa. He had a great heritage. He had a great man of God as a descendant. But by now, he's taken the blessings. What's this? He took the blessings that God gave his grandparents. And now he's enjoying it. And he thinks he's a big shot. And he's churlish. And he's evil because he inherited the wealth of his forefathers. But the only thing he did not inherit it. And some of you sitting out here are blessed. Some of you sitting out here, I mean, you're blessed up one side and down the other. But you're playing around with God. Or you pop into church when you feel like it. You're, you're just half cocked in this thing. You're not really, you're not really walking with God. You know what's going to happen to you? I can predict exactly what's going to happen to you. Yeah, you're going to string along. You're going to string along. But your grandchildren won't even be in church. You listen to what I'm telling you. Your grandchildren will not even be in church unless you get serious about your walk with God until you get some things settled and say, God, I will serve you no matter what. I will be diligent. I'll be faithful. I'm not going to play loose, fast and loose with you. I want to tell you something. Christ died for you on the cross. You owe him everything you are. Anyway, but he may have been like this. And this is what happens to us old hillbillies. We get to be 18, 19, 20, 22, 23, 25. We're trying to do a little business. We went and did a job for somebody and they ripped us off. How many has been there? Raise your hand. You've been ripped off trying to do something. All right, you know what? If you ain't careful, if you're not careful and don't get the grace of God, you become just like the guy that ripped you off. Are you listening to me? You'll get churlish and evil in your... You'll be one of these guys out here in the Ozarks that says, Bless God, nobody gave me nothing. I worked for everything I got. That makes me sick to hear that. That's a churlish person. They think, don't tell you something, you ain't got anything what God Almighty gave it to you. And other people helped you get it. Don't tell me. And so I'm saying this, maybe he got ripped off. But he became, if you, if you don't respond with grace to the people that cheat you, you'll wind up cheating somebody else down the road. And uh, he may have been out of the house of Caleb, but he allowed his heart to become hard and calloused and churlish and evil. And he may have had the admiration of everybody in the country. And they thought he's a big dude. But I want to tell you, it's not what men say of you, it's what God says of you. He may have been very great in the community. He may have had 3,000 sheep. He may have had 1,000 goats. He may have had a good and a godly wife. But what God said, Nabal is a fool. And I want to give you some quick things about why God called Nabal a fool and we'll be out of here. You say, Reggie, why did God call Nabal a fool? The very same reasons that makes people fools today. Number one, now let me give you a typology before we start. Nabal, uh, David again is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in this passage of scripture, okay? He's a type of Jesus Christ who has guarded your life, took care of things behind the scenes, brought you to this point. Nabal is a picture of a lost sinner. Abigail is a picture of the interceding Christian. The messengers are a picture of the Holy Ghost sent from God to bring the gospel news to the lost sinner. So that's your underlying picture under your surface story. He said, Reggie, why did God call Nabal a fool? Number one, and you're getting your Bibles now, the 25th chapter, he had no respect for the law of God. You are a fool if you do not respect the law of God. There were 10 men. The number 10 is the number of testimony. And it's not an accident that in verse number 5 that David sent 10 young men. Let me tell you something. In this nation, we're becoming a nation of fools because we have disregarded the law of God. He had no respect 
for the law of God. Can I tell you something? When God tells you thou shall not commit adultery, he is not joking. He's not playing around. He's not kidding. When God said thou shall honor thy father and thy mother, he is not joking. When he said thou shall not steal, he's not joking. God, when God, and by the way, that's just the Ten Commandments. The law is Genesis through Deuteronomy. God says honor that law. He says study that law. When God says to be modest, he's not joking. When God says to be uh, uh, Christ minded and whenever we need to live for God and do right and when God says let not man put us under God's not joking amen when God says don't look upon the nakedness of your neighbor God's not joking when God sends his law out the law is holy the law is good the law is righteousness it's a law that leads you to Jesus Christ none of us have kept the law but the law is holy it's a reflection of the holiness of almighty God this guy here he just fluffed him off America's fluffing the law off. We're taking the Ten Commandments out of our judicial system. No wonder we're clogged clogged up and nobody can get justice. Now I'm going to tell you something this morning here. You ever lied? You ever committed adultery? You ever had a look upon a woman with lust in your heart? I'm going to tell you something. The law is precious. The law is precious. Let me tell you why they don't want the Ten Commandments in courthouses and in schools and everywhere else. So they can do what they want to do. and And so they can set the rules and not God set the rules. I tell you what, listen, I remember, and I got, go to the store, but that man over in, in, in uh, Jordan, the driver of that bus, when he said he kept the law and he had never broke the commandments, but I finally nailed him on, thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. I'm saying this to you, that Nabal had no respect for the law when God sent the law to him. By the way, the law is that which brings men to salvation. The law is a schoolmaster to bring men to Christ. He's talking about unloading both barrels. When you get it, you got five here and five here, you unload that barrel, the law on them. I dealt with, dealt with a man yesterday and I talked to him and, and I didn't, I, I was nice to him, I was kind to him, but his, 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 his quote, supposedly mother-in-law said that he's my son-in-law. And then the next thing I know, he's telling me that they're fixing to get married. Amen. If they're not married, he's not a son-in-law. Right? right? But praise God, he said this. He said, I went and bought her a ring yesterday. And asked her to marry me. So they're going to get married. Can I say something to you? You're shacking up, you're living in sin. Yeah. You're shacking up, you're living in sin. I'm going to tell you, this nation does not want the law of God. I'm going to tell you, what every old huzzy out here, every old slut and whore wants to be able to get government checks, live in a government housing, feed government food, and they want to have four boyfriends and have 16 kids out of five different guys. It's killing this country. Amen. Killing this country. Amen. The law of God. The law of God. I want to tell you something right now. We're sitting around talking about same-sex marriage. We killed marriage. We redefined marriage a long time before the queers got loose in this country. Don't talk to me about your common law marriage either. Yeah. Marriage is a sacred ceremony. It's a sacred covenant between you and God. It's not between you and them. It's between you two and God. It's a covenant relationship. And what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. But you know what he said? Get your stinking law out of my life. Well, tell me what I can do or can't do. That was his attitude. That's the first reason God called Nabal a fool. And a man who turns away from the law of God will not read and listen and adhere and, and, and seek the law of God in his life is a fool. The Bible said, number two, he had, he had no respect for the law. Secondly, he refused to recognize the king. Look down in verse number 10 and 11. Nabal answered and these young men, the law, he answered, answered David's servant and said, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? Now I want to tell you something right there. He refused to recognize the king. Did you catch while we were reading Abigail's speech to David? How much she knew about David? She knew everything about David. She knew he was running from Saul. She knew he was being pursued. She knew he had been anointed. She knew he was going to be king someday. She knew everything about David. Are you telling me that Abigail knew everything and he didn't even know who he was? No, the problem was he would not recognize Jesus Christ for who he is. And that's the problem that a fool will have. Who is Jesus Christ? Let me tell you who Jesus Christ is. He's the name above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
Do you recognize him as your king? He's your creator. He's your sustainer. He's your reconciler. He's your redeemer. He's your king. He's your Lord. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. And he's coming in power and glory. He's going to reign upon this earth. I'm going to say to you, you say, man, I will not recognize him. I know farmers, workers, laborers, contractors, builders. I know people across this country, factory workers. They don't have any time for Jesus Christ. They don't recognize Jesus Christ. I'm telling you this morning, us Christians, you better recognize him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You are going to bow. You are going to confess that Jesus Christ is who the Bible says he is. Recognize him. Who's David? Who's Jesse? Sound like Pharaoh to me. Amen. Who's God? I'll tell you one thing. You were created to bring glory to him and to serve him. And if you don't do that, you've missed the whole purpose of your existence. Thirdly, he not only refused to set, recognize the king, but he rejected the king's offer of peace. Look with me in verse 5 and 6. The messengers came and David sent two young, ten young men. Look, they greeted him in David's name. Look at verse number six. Thus shall you say to him that liveth in prosperity, peace be both to thee and peace to thine house and peace unto all thy house. Three times the word peace is given there. Three is the number of divinity. It's divine peace being offered to him. I want to tell you something. Jesus Christ is offering you peace with God. Now, if you're here today or you're listening and you're not saved, you're at enmity with God. You're at war with God. A man who is not saved is at war with God. Hey, that's what liberalism and progressivism is at. They're at war with God. I was just reading this week about how the motto in God we trust got on our money and everything. Man, it's wild. You ought to read the story of how in God we trust. By the way, as late as 2006, Congress reaffirmed the motto in God we trust in this nation. Don't be ashamed of that. But the atheists and all that bunch are, are now suing. They're wanting to take that. God, we trust off our monies. There's a story about the man who induced Congress to have it put on your dollar bills. And I thank God for those Christians who stood and went into the political arena and went into the halls of Congress and said, we have got to put God at the head of this nation. And I thank God for congressmen and senators who voted for that. But here's a person who refused to recognize the king and refused to take his offer of peace. God comes to you and he tells you this. You've sinned against me. You're an enmity with me. We're cut off from each other. We're at war against each other. I'm holy. You're not holy. You've sinned. And God says, I have given my son. I told this man yesterday. I said, if, you had a, if I had a $30,000 fine at the courthouse and I was standing before the judge and the judge said to me, you either pay $30,000 to go to pen for life and I don't have it to pay. And you walk up to me and say to the judge, can I pay his fine? That judge can let you pay that fine. And I said, if he it lets you pay that fine for me, what's going to happen to me? And that lost boy looked at me and said, well, you go free. I said, you're right. I said, that's what will happen to you when you receive Jesus Christ and let him pay the penalty of your sin. You go free. Whom the son sets free, he's free indeed. And God offers you the offer of peace. January the 24th, 1982, God came to me and said, Reggie, I want to make peace. I want you and I to have peace. And I've made provisions so he can have peace. Your sins can be paid for, paid for, paid for, and you can have peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I have peace with God. I'm not at war with God anymore. Amen. And I'm just glad today, but he refused the offer of peace. You can walk out of this church house, maybe you listen to this broadcast, and you're going out through there and you're saying, I don't need God, I don't, I, I, I'm going to do it my way. No, you're not going to do it your way. And then fourthly, he did this. He railed on the king's messengers. He railed on the king's messengers. Look up in verse 14. They said, uh, David sent messengers to the wilderness to our master, and he railed on them. I want to give you a verse in case God ever calls you to preach. Every shepherd, here it is. Every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Every shepherd. You know what? Are you listening? You know why young men are not surrendering to preach? Because they know that. Are you hearing me? Every, not some of them, every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. You know what that means? That the world hates preachers of the Bible. They hate them. 
and they'll rail on them. When's the last time that you've seen a preacher portrayed in any kind of movie or television show or newscast where the preacher was portrayed as a decent, strong human being? No, he's always some wimp. He's always some candy. He's always some stupid. He's always some idiot. He's always some floozy. You know why? Because every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. And if there's anybody that this world hates, it's preachers that are preaching the word of God. And I'm going to tell you something. I remember one time a woman's situation. She said, I ain't working for no preacher. I said in the house one time. And some folks had had an inheritance and they were talking about the situation. And, and, and the man who died had put a preacher, that wasn't me, he had put a preacher in charge of his inheritance. And I know for a fact that that preacher did everything according to that man's last testament will. And he said, I want this done exactly this way. And the woman sat in her house because she didn't like some of the stuff her uncle did and said that. And that's a preacher. When you hear somebody talking about that, now here's the deal. God said you're a fool, number one, because you didn't respect the law of God. Number two, you would not recognize the king. Number three, you rejected the king's offer of peace. And number four, you railed on the king's messengers. And I want to tell you how dangerous it is. Now listen, I'm a preacher by calling, not by choice. I'm just being honest about it. I ain't spiritual, but I'm glad he called me. I'm glad he called me. And I, and I love preaching and all that, but I'm going to tell you something. You know what I knew, Brother Phil? I knew if I preached and preached what that Bible teaches, that most of my friends I grew up around here, they'd talk about me when I'm back was done that, because I'd already heard it. You see, when the living, how many's lived in the lost world? You know, one of the lost world's favorite subjects is preachers. A blessed, godly preacher. He's deceased now, gone on to be with the Lord up here at Mountain Grove. His son, I mean, just rebelled against everything he ever did. And one night out of the beer party, they said he put it here. He said, did a toast to my dad. Said, it wasn't for guys like me, my dad would be out of business. It's called a railing on preachers. It's called a railing on the message, messenger of God. Can I tell you something? Hey, listen to this. Get this is a great truth. What were the names of those ten men? Doesn't tell you. You know what that's telling you? It ain't me. I'm not important. The preacher is just a messenger. How many of you go out? You got a bill in the mail. It wasn't your bill. It wasn't your bill. How many of you run back out the next day to the post office waiting on that mailman? And he comes. He drives up, waves at you. You say, I ain't going nowhere until I talk to you, dude. You brought me a stinking bill. It wasn't mine. I'll tell you, sorry, low down. Amen. What are you railing on the mailman for? What are you railing on the mailman for? You know, everybody tell me what's the 11th commandment in here at this church. What's the 11th commandment? Don't be on these grounds. Do not discuss junk on this building, we, on this property. We came to worship God, to preach, to sing, to pray, to lift up the Lamb of God, to encourage each other. We didn't come to tear each other up. Amen. I'm going to tell you what. You know why the 11th commandment is here? Yeah. I'll tell you what, I would not know. I've lost track. I've lost count of the times I stepped out behind this pulpit. Maybe started on my way out. Slip up to you. How you doing? Well, I'm going to tell you how I'm doing. Come on. I'm going to tell you something right now. Just forget I'm here. Just forget I'm here. One of the smartest things you'll ever do to your family is never allow them to rail on the messengers of God. That might be a deacon, that might be just a friend, it might be a man in church, it might be just somebody who took the word of God to you, but I'll tell you, stupidest thing you'll ever do. God says you're a fool to rail on the messengers of God. That old boy comes to your house and knocks on your door, puts his hand on your shoulder and says, I want to tell you something, I love you, I'd like for you to be saved. Don't you cuss him out, don't you give him a hard time. I'm telling you, don't rail on the messengers of God. Hey, did you know what it might be your mama, kids? I'll tell you what, I remember, remember my dancing story? You've heard it 42 times. You know it from front to back. But I want to tell you something. I come in that house. My mom had that report done. I said, what are you doing taking dance class? And I want to tell you what. I begin to rail on my mama. I guess I can't do anything. Oh, yeah, yeah. Rah, 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 rah. You know, I can't do nothing around here. I'm, I'm going to do what I want to do. And I packed my clothes and headed to my car. 
You know what? You know what turned me around, Phil, was knowing my mom loved me. Second thing, knowing my mom was right. <laughs> Amen. I'll tell you something. You ain't going to do no good railing on your mama when she's trying to straighten you out. <clears throat> your daddy walks in your room and says, what's that junk on the wall doing? Don't you rail on your daddy. Don't you come in this, don't you be, oh, you be, be, be what? Hey, well, scoot over, I'm going to tell you what my dad did the other day. I tell you, I'm sick and tired of it. I'm leaving home. He come up here and told me I couldn't do this and told me I couldn't do that. I told him I wanted to buy a pickup truck. He said he wasn't old enough yet. My dad's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. Woo! It's quiet. I'm preaching now. I'm going to tell you when you're preaching, when the amen stops. That's exactly right. When it's quiet, you're preaching finally. I want to tell you something. Listen, don't rail on those, the messengers of God. It ain't just Reggie. It's your mama. It's your daddy. It may be a friend in church. It may be an uncle. It may be an aunt. It may be a brother or a sister. It's helping you. Don't rail on them. Don't cut them off just because they told you the truth. Am I your enemy because I tell you the truth, the Bible said? And then the next reason God said he called him a fool is in verse number 15 to 16, it tells you, that the messenger, one of the men said he, he was very good to us. We were not hurt, neither missed anything. Verse 16, they were wall on us. And then you get down to verse 21, and it says this in verse 21, the last part of the verse, he hath requited me evil for good. Now, I'm going to tell you something, a scientific fact this morning. You are breathing God's good air, yes. not your air. You're living on God's earth. You're eating God's food. You are drinking God's water. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And God's been good to you. In fact, yesterday, this young man was telling me, he said, Reggie, six months ago, he said, I woke up in the middle of 95 Highway, Mount Grove, Missouri. He said, I've been stone drunk. And he said, two friends of mine that we got into it with, he said, about beat me to death. He said, a woman drove up and found them stomping my head. In the, he said, taking her boots and stomping my head in the pavement. 95 Highway. And he said, they about killed me. He said, and I didn't even know it. So they took me to the doctor's office. Got up, and he said, I left out of the area for a while. I said, it was so bad. And I said to him this. I said, let me tell you why you didn't die that night. I said, God being good to you. The same reason that I'm not in hell tonight. And I couldn't help but break down, Brother Don. I said, let me tell you, son, you're 25 years old, but I was there one time. And I said, there were nights, Kenny, when I should have been in hell. There were nights when my car went across the highway and flew across the ditch and through the fences and didn't hit a tree and didn't hit a culvert just a few feet away. Spun around and blood all over my face from hitting, waking up from being asleep. Um, there's nights when I crawl around and didn't know how I got home. Oh, you think some of you sitting here, some of you new people here thinks I'm some kind of somebody. I'm nothing but a sinner saved by the grace of God. Amen. Yes, amen. I, I'm sick. Of, I'm ashamed for my children to hear it. I'm ashamed for my grandchildren to hear it. But I know what it is to be drunk out of your stupid mind. I know what it is for sin to take you near there. I was on the brink of hell. God was good to me. He was a wall. He was a wall. How many of you in here look back at your life and say God was a wall to me? I'd been in hell if it hadn't been for the wall of God in my life. I want to tell you this much. He refused. He returned David good, evil for good. That's why God called him a fool. Wouldn't it, it pitiful? You know, I want to tell you how good God is to you this morning. You're maybe sitting in this church house and you're on your way to hell. You're not saved. You're living in sin. You don't recognize Jesus Christ. You've never, you refused his offer of peace. God's been good to you. He could take you out right now if he wanted to. But he's been good to you. He let you come to church this morning and hear how to be saved. That Jesus Christ, God's son, died on the cross of Calvary and took your sin upon him. And God punished Christ. In your place. He died in your place for your sin. And he was buried and he rose again the third day to give you eternal life. Eternal life. That's the gospel. God's good to you. He let you, he let you hear that this morning. I want to tell you something. God, God wants to be your friend. He wants to be your father. He wants to be your savior. I'm telling you, God is good. But he turned that away. Have you, made, have you returned the Lord evil for good? There's another thing he did in verse 17, the last part of that verse. He refused to listen to, to others' counsel. 
They said he's such a man to be allowed, you can't even talk to him. It's called a reprobation. You just get to where nobody can tell you nothing. They said he's such a son of Belial, you can't talk to him. I want to go back to this, this save side of this issue. Sometimes a saved men, we go through a lot of battles in life and garbage. We get hard. Our wives try to talk to us. We don't listen. Brother in church tries to talk to us. We don't listen. Ain't nobody can talk to us. We become a little Christian Nabal. Verse 36 tells us he refused to repent. You know what's crazy? He was within a hair of all himself and all them men being killed. His wife stopped it. She comes back down to the house. You know what he's doing? He's, he's feasting and getting drunk. The Bible said he got very drunken. This is the foolishness of sin. He just go flopping on toward eternity. Doing the same old stupid stuff. He's sitting up at his house drunk. And 400 men with their swords drawn are coming toward him. And if it had not been for the intervention of his wife. And here's an important thing. You listen to me well. I believe, death, I believe in deathbed salvation. I've seen people get saved and they dying. But it ain't, it ain't real common. Amen. I want to show you something in here. That's not why he was a fool. He failed to realize his lost condition. But he died in the place of rejection. I want you to look in verse number uh, 36. And Abigail came to Nabal. And he held a feast in his house like the feast of the king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Whereof she told him nothing less or more until the morning light. Why? He's drunk. You see, you can get yourself in a condition. Ain't going to do no good. I don't want you getting mad at me this morning. I don't want you taking this wrong, but I'm going to tell you something. <clears throat> when Amer- in America now, when you die, generally speaking, if, I'm, I'm talking about if you have an illness and you're aged, okay? I'm not talking about if you have an accident or a heart attack, boom, boom, to fall over dead instantly. But I'm talking about if you're up to hospital and you're dying, they call the family in. How many knows what the situation is going to be when you get there? And you're honest to goodness dying, you're not going to be in your right mind. They're going to have you doped up. It's too late. I, I, maybe I shouldn't say too late. I've, I've whispered in the ear of dying men, Jesus died for you. You need to repent and re- believe on him, trust him. When they could not respond to me, I've done it. I'm just going to be honest with you. I, I, I'm a little bit leery about this. Oh, they died so easily. Really? Maybe they were so doped up they couldn't scream. You know what? We don't want to hear the screams of the damned anymore dying. There are literally books out there that have recorded testimony of men. And before America started doping us all up when we died, people screaming. Oh, God. And people crying out, God, save me. God, save me. But God wouldn't hear them. They'd send away their day of grace. The Bible said the Lord smote him and his heart died within him. His heart turned into stone. He laid there 10 days. He laid there 10 days and died and never got saved. Fell into hell and he's there this morning while I've been preaching. Are you listening to me? Why? Because he returned evil for good. He refused to repent. He didn't recognize the king. Now I'm just going to tell you this morning. I like to preach encouraging messages, lifting messages, everybody having a wonderful time. But that ain't where we're at in the life of David. We're in a bad situation here. And I'm telling you this, you can still be alive and it's too late for you. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm thinking of a man right now. It's just like God said, Reggie, I'm done with him. Leave him alone. You say, well, Lord, I don't want to have that thought. Reggie, I am done with him. I, it's over. Don't waste your time. Ephraim is joined to his idols. Leave him alone, God said to the prophet. It's over. Too late. It's called sending away a day of grace. Not I got saved. I literally, at 28 years of age, I literally believe I was there, Brother Coop. 
you ain't got to be 60, 70, 80 years old. I was 28 years old. And as God Almighty is my witness, and I am going to stand and give account of this preaching message today, God is my witness. I sat in three seats from the back, Holy Ghost dealing with me. I didn't even hardly know what the preacher was even preaching on. God was dealing with me to be saved. And it's like something sung in my heart and said, if you refuse me tonight, it's done. Over. And that is when the fear of God fell on me. And I didn't care at that point what anybody thought. I thought, man, I'm, I mean, there was a fear of God fell on me. I said, I don't care what daddy thinks, mama thinks, brothers think. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care what my friends think. I'm getting saved. I'm not dying and going to hell over what somebody else thinks. And you may hate my guts, but I've told you the truth this morning. Amen. Forget about it. Hey, you say, well, I'd get saved with Reg Kelly. I don't like him. Why don't you forget about me? You're not going to stand before me at judgment day. Amen. I'm just a messenger. Forget about me. Don't stumble over me going to hell. Let's bow our heads. Father, this morning, we just pray that you'd use this message for your glory. God, you called Nabal a fool. And Lord, you give us the reasons why. And Lord, I I can't fault Nabal this morning because I look at myself. And Lord, I've been a fool before I was saved and I've been a fool after I was saved. I've done the very things, Lord, he's done. But I thank you, Lord, for your grace. I thank you, Lord, that you didn't cut me off. I'm glad, Lord, you didn't give up on me. I'm glad for the long suffering of God. Now, Lord, I just pray, oh, Holy Spirit, do what needs to be done. In Jesus' name, as our heads are bowed this morning, I give you my heart, and I'm going to tell you the truth. I really did not want to preach this message. I kept kind of, look, Lord, give me something, give me something. Give me something more upbeat, something more encouraging for these people, Lord. But I'm just going to tell you the truth. This is the letter God put in my hand and said, you deliver it. If you're here this morning, you're lost without God. Listen, I'm not out to condemn you. God isn't either. He said he didn't come to condemn, but to save. You're already condemned. Nobody can condemn you. You're already condemned. But what I can do is give you the good news, the gospel, that Jesus died in your place for your sin. And God tells you to turn from that. Turn from the world. Turn from sin. Turn to Jesus Christ this morning. Place your faith and trust in his death, burial, and resurrection, that he died for you and paid your sin debt and paid it all. And paid it forever. Now I'm going to tell you something this morning. God don't lie to nobody. He said if you'll call on him, he'll save you. And so I'm asking you right now while we're bowed. I'm asking you to do just that. I'm not much on giving, coming to the front invitations anymore. Maybe I should. When I think about that, listen to me. You say, I'd get saved. But let me just tell you something. Jesus Christ hung naked and beaten And shamed on the cross for you. You can't even get anybody to walk to the front of the church and say, I want to trust Christ as my Savior and want to tell folks I've I've been saved. I love the Lord. I want to thank Him for forgiving my sin. We're so full of pride. We're so worried about what everybody thinks. That's so stupid. We're foolish. But I just want to tell you this. We're going to head out to baptism waters here in just a little bit. And I'm going to tell you, you could get saved right where you're sitting. Right now. If you'll say, God, I know I'm a sinner. Ain't no question about it. Hey, that's a good start because you've not turned the law away. You've recognized the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. And may I encourage you by saying this, that nobody in this building or outside of this building or within the sound of my voice anywhere in the world, never been a man live except Jesus Christ who did not commit sin. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. This church is full of sinners that's been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. It's not a bunch of self-righteous people. We're nothing apart from the grace of God. And I want you to know we love you. God loves you. Jesus loves you. He died for you. If you'll ask him to save you this morning, say, God, I'm, I'm leaving the world that I've been in. I'm leaving it. I'm done. I'm sick of it and tired of it. I want Christ. I want to go to heaven when I die. And I want to have a life worth living now. If you'll call on the Lord, he'll save you. Just pray something like, dear God, I'm coming to you for salvation this morning. 
Oh, I need my sins forgiven. God, please forgive me through the blood of Jesus Christ. Wash me white as snow. Cleanse me from my sin. And Lord, I don't know much about it, but I'm going to take you at your word. I'm going to trust Jesus died for me. I'm going to trust you, Lord, that he rose from the dead. Let me tell you, listen to me tight. No other religious leader in the world in history ever rose from the dead. It is the resurrection that proves the lordship and kingship of Jesus Christ. And he has power to save. He'll resurrect you spiritually and he'll resurrect resurrect you physically someday. I'm asking you right now to trust Christ as your savior. There's a simple prayer in the Bible says this, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You ask him, he'll save you. If you've prayed that this morning, you don't need me patting you on the back and telling you you're saved. You may need the assurance of God's word, but here's what you need to do. Next thing you need to do is get baptized. We're going to have one here in a little bit. You're welcome. Walk up to me and say, listen, I got saved while I go in church. I want to get baptized. I may ask you a question or two, but that's okay. (laughs) Just to make sure you understood. And then you say, well, I don't know about today. Well, we'll run the water full next week for you. Whatever, Whatever you need. And then you need to get in church. You need to get in your Bible. You need to start walking with God. You need, to, you, you need to let God change your life. Become a Christian. Follow the Lord. Now you ain't going to be without sin. All right? That's why he died for you. Because you can't live sinless. But you ought to live a lot less sinning. And you ought to ask, walk close enough to God that when he deals with you as a Christian, you get it right. And he'll deal with you as a son at that point instead of a sinner. You see, when you got saved, you, you became a son. Now he chastised you, whoop you. And, uh, but anyway, so I pray you'll do that. Let's stand together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day in the Ozarks that you've given us. We thank you for the precious word of God. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would take up where I've failed. I pray, God, if I've said something that would hinder somebody from being saved or growing in the Lord, that you'd strike it from their mind. But what I have said, Lord, from the Bible that's right and true and will be a help to them on their way to God, I pray that you'll stamp it in their soul. Lord, we thank you for a day to worship you. We bless your holy name and we need you. We pray now, Lord, you put your blessing upon this baptismal service. And Lord, that you would be glorified. And Lord, make some old sinner drive down the ramp. Maybe who you've been dealing with, Lord, and see the baptism service and get to thinking about what they need to do. Use it every way you can, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.